I'm excited to be opening God's Word with you today. I believe He's going to speak to us. And um, aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, good to have Ryan and Laura back with us. If you didn't know, they were vacationing and meeting with friends in Great Britain over the last week. Got back late last night. Kind of jet lagged out of their brains. And uh, Ethan came back a little bit under the weather, so be praying for Ethan. But hey, my grandson's got his first stamp in the passport. Isn't that right? Here we go. Call to the nations. Yeah, I love it. Um, I myself have been uh, the last two Sundays in Vietnam where we do, God's opened a door for us to do a lot of work. And uh, a new door that's opening to us that we're very excited about being a part of a strategic team that will be uh, looking at how we can reach the final tribes in Southeast Asia that have never had the gospel before. Over 100 tribes, church never in their soil and in their language, where people that have been born there, lived and died there without ever hearing the name of Jesus one time. This time last week I was with a group of about seven young Vietnamese and um, all followers of Jesus now, how cool is that, raised in a communist, atheistic, nominally Buddhist culture where they were collegian young adults before they ever heard the story of Jesus. And sitting with them that evening one by one listening to their stories of conversion and transformation, common themes emerged. The very first theme was skepticism. I don't know if I can believe this or not. Second theme was, man, I had a friend that came to Jesus and the change in their character and the change in their vocabulary and, and, and the change in their perspective and, and, and the change in, 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 their, in their sense of purpose. It really made me curious because of the change in their life Maybe Jesus is real, and then a press into discovery, and then conviction. These themes emerged, and and receiving Jesus as Lord, baptism, many of them in the room in the springtime, uh, Becky and I and our students were part of their baptisms in the South China Sea, where we had to watch and make sure this happened fairly quickly with the whole church family there before the communist officials came around. And then rejection by family for walking away from their ancestor worship and denying their heritage. And becoming a part of the family of God to replace the families of rejection. And I was struck with the words of one young lady who said this. She said, when I first heard the story of Jesus, she said the truth, the light, went straight to the very core and to the deepest parts of my being. I thought, God, I want to get back there again with truth. Take me back to that place that when revelation and truth and the curtains are rolled back and I see something in Scripture or something is said, that God, it just goes right back to the core of my being. Anybody with me on that? Huh? I want to walk in transformation. I want to walk in revelation. I want to walk in that kind of response when I hear truth, and, and I pray today that as we open the word that, that, that revelation comes to us and, and truth goes deep and transformation comes, because isn't that why we're here today? And didn't we just sing in the beginning that we didn't just walk in the room today, but Jesus walked in the room today, isn't that right? Where two or three are gathered in his name, where's he at? Right here. And we may not feel it today, but he's here. And he's here as an agent of change. And he's here to bring victory. He's here to bring breakthrough. He's here to bring conviction. He's here to bring healing. So, boy, God save us from autopilot today. He wants to make make a difference today. I, I want to get right into the word. I'm excited about being a part of this series entitled Bear With Me, isn't that right? I know uh, I've been gone a couple of weeks, a couple of Sundays, but we've been going through Bear With Me. So let's get right into the word this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read it from the screen, if we can pop that up there, all right? David, this is pre-King Days, all right? Soon to be anointed, uh, be uh, uh, placed and installed as king, but David is not king yet. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag, They'd attacked Ziklag and burned it, all right? And they had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, 
but they carried them off as they went on their way. And when David and his men, about 600 men, reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire. Their wives, sons, and daughters had been taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, who was the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And verse 6 says, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and his daughters. But I love what it says here, but David found strength. Better translation, David strengthened himself, guys. David encouraged himself. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, son of Ahimelech, he said, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? He hears from the Lord, pursue them. Here we go. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. Another version says this, you will succeed in the rescue and catch this, you will recover everything. Everything that was lost, you will recover. I love David. I love his story. I love David's calling. And not just the story of David as Israel's greatest king, but the entire decade before as we meet him as a shepherd boy and his journey in preparation toward kingship. I love his story. We find him initially in obscurity, the youngest of seven brothers, tending the sheep on the hillside all by himself, night after night. We see his life begin in in obscurity. We go through a story of disrespect, where Samuel the prophet comes to anoint one of the seven sons of Jesse to be the next king, and and David's not even invited to the lineup. He's so little thought of by his family. And and we go through this this time of disrespect, and, and Samuel says, you know, is this all you got? Well, there is one more. He's taking care of the sheep. Go get him. And he was anointed the next king because God looks where? Because God looks on the heart. Isn't that right? So we see in this, in this story, this decade before uh, kingship, um, surprise, it's like picture David <laughs> suddenly as a teenager, he's kneeling before Samuel and he doesn't know what's going on. And suddenly as his head is bowed down, he feels the oil of the Lord dripping over his head and down onto his shoulders. And somewhere back in the back of his brain in that section entitled Childhood Memories, all right, isn't this, some, isn't this, what, what, isn't this what prophets do to kings? Is, is Samuel anointing me to be the next king? Absolutely, David. Surprise, that's what's going on here. But that's, that decade of preparation in David's story doesn't stop there as he moves into a challenge phase where he goes to serve in, 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 in Saul's castle and how many know Saul's got issues and suddenly he's using David for spear practice it's like what have I done he stays in the castle as long as he can but when he's forced out he's hunted down like a dog through every river and valley and every cave and and it's a season of challenge that decade of preparation that decade of becoming in David's life I think was filled with a whole lot of somebody bear with me in this Anybody going to come alongside me? Um, Will you please be patient with me? I haven't arrived yet. I think that season of decade of preparation was, will somebody stand by me? Come on, show me a little grace. I'm new at this. I don't know what's going on. I'm just hanging on for dear life with God, and I know he's called me to be the next king. So David was preparing, uh, being prepared by God to be the next king of Israel. And I want to say this morning that bear with me does not mean, hey, this is just who I am, so deal with it. Bear with me is not as requesting of others, excuse my behavior because this is how I've always been. Bear with me recognizes that we're on a journey, we're becoming, we're not yet everything that God has called us to be. He's tinkering, he's rearranging, he's working on our character, and God is moving us in a direction. Bear with me is not judging each other. Hmm? Kingdom culture can never be cancel culture. 
Your last words, your last actions, your last mistakes, you blew it, we're done with you. You're irrelevant, you're kicked to the curb, you no longer have a voice, you're no longer necessary, you no longer have a, have a, have a future. That is the emerging cancer, cancel culture, cancer, that's probably a good word too, cancel culture in America today. Kingdom culture can never be cancel culture. I don't know about you, but I've had my share of judges in life. Have you? You know what I'm talking about? People that feel like it's their ministry to point out all your flaws. I have a, I have a, la- a label. That's not good. I, I have a recommendation. Maybe they ought to call their ministry First Stone Ministries. Hmm? They're always ready to cast the first stone, isn't that right? You know what I'm talking about. So bear with me is not judging each other, all right? When people have judged you, how has that helped you move forward in God? Like one guy said, uh, I knew you were judgmental from the first day I met you. Just, just leave that right there, okay. Why bear with one another? Because like David We are all under construction. We haven't become all that God has called us to be yet, so we're called to bear with each other. Why bear with one another? Because like David, each and every one of us in this room has a call of God on our lives. We have a purpose in God. We have a destiny in God. So we need to bear with each other, stand with each other, applaud each other, be patient with each other. Fruit of the Spirit, be long-suffering with each other. What's that mean? Well, we can't be long-suffering with somebody until we've been long-bothered by somebody. We're under construction. We all have a call of God on our lives. And this is not just for younger people in the room. We're all under construction. We all have a call. Moses at 80. Abraham at 90. The biggest season of life and ministry was in front of them at age 80 and age 90. Come on. 90. Abraham could have been a part of the greatest generation. The greatest generation in America, the youngest ones are 90 this year. All right? So even if you're a part of the greatest generation in the room today, your greatest days and season of God can still be ahead of you. You got a call. You got a purpose. You got a destiny to fulfill. All right? And I'm not even, not even going to get into Methuselah at 969 years old. We'll just leave that right where it is. We all need those who bear with us, believe in us, and show a little grace because we are in process, we're under construction, and because we have a calling of God on our lives. And for David, three areas during this decade of preparation that God was working in his life. He was, okay, work, worship, and warfare, all right? God was working on David's work ethic before he became king. Worship. God was helping David become a man after his own heart before he stepped into his ministry. And warfare. God was showing him that the weapons that he had in his possession really worked. Warfare. Because there was a battle over his life and a battle over his calling. And I love what it says about David. Whether it was a lion that attacked him, or whether it was a bear that attacked the few sheep that he was responsible for, or whether it was a Goliath, nine foot nine, that attacked his nation and the reputation of his God, that David was learning in this decade of preparation to run to the battle. He ran, it says he ran toward Goliath. He ran toward the bear. He ran toward the lion. He didn't run from it. He didn't hide from it. God was preparing him to be a warrior king. And David was learning to run to the battle because the name of his God was at stake. All right? So, I don't know that David ever used the words bear with me, but God brought people into his life in this decade of preparation. We've talked about it in the last couple of weeks. 
the best friend, Jonathan, isn't that right? And, and Jonathan was an encourager, and Jonathan stood beside him in the darkest hours of his life, and he bore with him through tough times. The unlikely voice, Abigail. Abigail was a young lady who was married to a man named Nabal. You know the name Nabal it means fool, and she's married to a fool. Probably an arranged marriage she had no choice over. But she becomes an unlikely voice. And, but both of these two, Jonathan and Abigail, knew, one, that David was still under construction, and two, they knew that the call of God to be king was on his life. And Jonathan, through all the trials and tribulations with his father Saul, Jonathan kept saying to David, you know what, hang in there, it's going to be okay. God has called you, and you're going to be the next king, and I'm going to be next to you. Even though, by right, the throne was Jonathan's. He knew the call on David's life. And Abigail, when David is ready to go bust some heads, he might be the sweet singer of Israel, but he's a, he's a man that's ready for a fight. And, 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 and Nabal messes him over, and he and his men, he says, boys, let's saddle up. Let's go for a ride. Let's go bust some heads. Abigail hears about it, and she, she intercepts David on the road of his rage. Don't do this, David. You're going to be the next king. If you do this, this is going to be a black mark on the rest of your, of, of, your, of your leadership, your ministry, your kingship. You don't want to do this. And her wise counsel kept him from a messy mark that would have stuck with him a long, long time. Oh, never mind. Well, I'll just throw it out there. Saved him from a Miles Garrett moment. That's really hard for me right now. Because I like this young man. And will he ever be able to be to live up to his potential? Will society and culture let him? We won't go down that road this morning. But David had the potential of doing something that dumb that would have stuck with him possibly for the rest of his life. So, incidentally, recognizing he's still under construction, recognizing calling are two keys, I believe, uh, to, be, to being a good disciple of other people. You know we're called to make disciples, every one of us? Come on. Um, recognizing that people are still under construction, recognizing that every person has a call of God on their lives, helps us become a better parent. It helps us become a better youth leader. It helps us become a better small group leader. It helps us become a better friend because a good discipler hmm, recognizes and sees another's potential. People that judge only see people where they are. They don't see where God can take them and what God can do with them. But we're called to bear with each other, stand by each other, believe in each other, cheer each other on. Show a little grace from time to time because we can see what God is doing. We can sense where God is taking them. And those things with our kids, to friends in church, to family, whatever the case may be, that helps us bear with one another. Discipler sees another's potential and bears with until they become. Jonathan's, Abigail's, hmm? one day a Nathan in the story of David, they are key to us fulfilling the call of God on our lives. But sometimes, like David, we can find ourselves all alone with nobody around. What happens in those moments when nobody is around us to talk to us, to encourage us, to bear with us, to stand by us, to cheer us on? What happens when we are all alone? What we do in those moments can make all the difference in the world to us growing in our faith and fulfilling our calling and destiny and purpose in God. What happens in those moments when nobody's around? And we read the story in 1 Samuel. Ziklag, David's temporary hometown with his men, it's burned to the ground. Everything and everybody is gone. And Jonathan is off in battle. And Abigail's been kidnapped. And Nathan is nowhere to be around. And guys, in those moments, when we're all by ourselves... What does it mean to bear with me when that conversation is only happening in our own heads? What does it mean that David encouraged himself in the Lord? What does it mean 
that David got a hold of himself and encouraged himself in the Lord. In these moments when Abigail's carried off and Jonathan's off in battle and we're all by ourselves, we need to be a friend and a cheerleader and a supporter to our own calling, to our own purpose in God. We need to stir it up in ourselves. We need to bear with ourselves. In those moments, hear me, how we talk to ourselves, it makes all the difference in the world. You ever hear somebody talk to themselves? Kind of make you nervous? Like, come on, honey, let's get the kids and go the other direction type of thing. Huh? We, 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 somehow, we've come to believe that normal people do not do this. But the Bible has as much to say about our conversations we have with ourselves. It has a lot to say about our conversations we have with ourselves. And how we support and how we show a little grace and how we bear with ourselves can make all the difference in the world. In fact, scientists tell us that we talk to ourselves ten times faster than other human beings talk to us. That's a lot of words in a big hurry. We talk to ourselves inside our heads ten times faster than other people talk to us. In fact, well, that's three to 4,000 words a minute. That's a lot of talk. Maybe you're thinking you've never met my mother. We won't go there, all right? Three to 4,000 words a minute. And the big question is, three to 4,000 words a minute going through our heads, uh, what are we saying to ourselves? Truth is, we think words of others impact us more, but that's not true. No matter how positive or negative the words of others are, the words that we say to ourselves has a bigger impact on our growth, on our becoming, and on the fulfilling of our calling than any of the words of anybody else. So what do we say to ourselves when we talk to ourselves? Sometimes it's just the routine reminders and the stuff of life and how we're interpreting it. And our self-talk can make all the difference in those moments, all right? In 1 Samuel 30, David has returned to his temporary hometown. The city is burned to the ground. Family is taken captive. And his men are ready to assassinate him. He's in a mess. These men are described in 1 Samuel 22. You know, there was a season when David was all alone running from Saul. Isn't that right? And then slowly, one by one, and then t- groups of tens and more men who were also on the run or, or, or disenfranchised with the king, they start coming to him. In 1 Samuel 22, 2, it says, And all of the men who were distressed, in debt, and discontented came to David, and he became their leader. How would you like that for a congregation? All those who were distressed, in debt, or discontented came to him, and he became their leader, all right? And these men now are ready to assassinate David. And David's all alone with his thoughts. What an opportunity to beat yourself up. What an an opportunity for words to become weapons inside our heads. What were you thinking? You idiot. You blew it. You never get anything right. It's all over. It'll never happen. You're finished. What an opportunity for words become weapons in our heads. Uh, my dad's here with us today. Hey, Dad. My dad has a term for this. He calls it stinking thinking. Anybody ever experienced stinking thinking? All right. Stinking thinking. In that lonely moment, David had a choice. No Jonathan, no Abigail, no Nathan around. And I love what verse 6 says. David encouraged himself in the Lord. All right? David encouraged himself in the Lord. He, what does that mean? He got a hold of himself. He strengthened himself. He reminded himself of his purpose and of his calling. And it was a key to his destiny. It was a key to, for him to fulfill the purposes of God in his life. It was former Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes who said these words. Too many men go to their graves with their music still inside them. What part does self-talk play in that? I don't know about you, but when my number's up or when Jesus returns, whichever comes first, I want every note of everything that God has planned for me 
to do on this planet, to serve him, to honor him, to glory. I want it all played out. How about you? I don't want to take any notes of God's purposes for my life to my grave with me. Well, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And it was the key to fulfilling his call. Um, if he doesn't in that moment, his family's lost. If he doesn't encourage himself in that moment, his future is lost. If he doesn't encourage himself in that moment, his kingship is lost. How he talked to himself in that moment made the difference between life and death, not just for himself. And what do you think he said to himself? What does it even mean to encourage yourself in the Lord? Well, maybe he's recalling scripture promises, all right? Maybe, maybe he's recalling things that God had spoken to his heart. Maybe he was remembering what it was like to feel the oil pull, pour, pouring down over his head when he was anointed by Samuel. Maybe, maybe he was saying, God, you gave me a lion, you gave me a bear, you gave me a Goliath, and I don't know what to do in this moment, but you were with me then, and I know you can be, he's stirring himself up, he's encouraging himself, he's reminding himself of great moments in God. Maybe he's pulling out his family scrapbook and saying, God, look at the family you've given me, look at the kids you've given me, it can't stop now, I gotta keep moving forward. God, give me a strategy, show me what to do. However he did it, He built himself up to the point where he was no longer defeated, no longer paralyzed, no longer stuck to the circumstances of his own doing. No longer stuck because of self-talk. Powerful scripture here, Proverbs 23, 7. I should have put it on the screen, but as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Wow, that's powerful stuff. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. This scripture is all, all about the prophetic nature of self-talk. It's all through scripture. Isaiah 14, Lucifer, who would become Satan. Lucifer in heaven, Isaiah 14 says, has a conversation with himself about why am I number two? I want to be like God. I can be like God. And in this pride and prideful conversation he has in his brain, it leads to his downfall getting kicked out of heaven because of a conversation he had with himself. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, my kingdom this, my kingdom that, look who I am, look how great I am. And the conversation he's having in his own head causes God to judge him and his pride. He ends up grazing like a wild animal out in the fields. Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells the story of a rich farmer. And he's saying, man, it's incredible. I am so blessed. I got to build bigger barns. I got to I got to do stuff to accommodate all the wealth that's coming my way. And he's having this conversation in his own head and the scripture says because of his pride his life is required of him. But what I love is Matthew chapter 9. There was a woman in Matthew chapter 9 that had been sick for a long long time. And the Bible says she said to herself if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. And pushing her way through the crowds and reaching out and touching the hem of his garment, Jesus noticed. And he said, who touched me? It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, what are you talking about? Everybody wants, it's like this. Jesus, everybody's trying to touch you. No, somebody reached out in faith and legitimately touched me. And the scripture says, in Luke cha or Matthew chapter 9, her self-talk, catch this, her self-talk was the difference between terminal illness and divine healing. I just got a simple question for us today. How's your self-talk? As, we as we've been talking about bearing with others, Encouraging others, standing with others, believing with others, cheering others on. How are we doing with ourselves? How is your self-talk today? The scripture says once David encouraged himself in the Lord, that he inquired in the Lord. How I translate that, it, David said, God, now that I'm thinking straight, what do you want me to do? How many of you know, you know it's important before you make decisions that you're thinking straight? Is that right? So David's saying, God, okay, I got a hold of myself. I've encouraged myself. I'm good. 
So God, what do you want me to do? You know, you hear it said of the best people in business or the best people in sports, all right, are people who know how to quickly put failure in the past and focus on the next opportunity. Hmm? The best shooters in the NBA, they can have a bad night, they're firing away the next night. The best closers in baseball can blow a save and they're right back at it the next, next, next day. The best people in business can see a, something turn sour and go south, but they get right back at it because they've been called to business and they know business. The best people in business and sports quickly put failure in the past and get ready for the next opportunity. And David said, Lord, what do you want me to do? His self-talk could have deepened his depression or advanced his anger. But instead, he asked the Lord, and here's what he heard. Pursue them. I love this. Pursue them, and you will recover everything. How good is that? In fact, maybe that's a word of the Lord to somebody today. You're thinking, God, what am I supposed to do? Huh? What did David do? He ran to the battle every time. And God tells him this time, pursue them. Run to the battle, and you will, don't hide Don't bury your head in the sand. Don't hope it all goes away. Don't say, I'm going to hang back and let circumstances. No, pursue them, he says to David, and you will recover everything. Remember those 1 Samuel 22, 2 guys, the the distressed, those in debt and the discontented? I love this. Because of David's steps of courage and because they they recover everything, because there's great celebration, the wives are back, the kids are back, the flocks are back, the herds are back. God, you've helped us recover everything. They too have a, they're not ready to assassinate him. They're ready to say, when's coronation time, baby? And some of them become the 30. David's mighty men. And scripture takes time to, to, to take note of their great exploits as they fulfill the call of God on their lives because they had a leader that got a hold of himself and said, God, what do you want me to do? And encouraged himself in the Lord. And as he stepped up and moved forward, it created a groundswell of opportunity for a lot of other guys to step up. The 30, the three. Because of the, the leadership and the ministry and the example in David's life, uh, Uh, Beyond the 30, there were the three. And they're in battle, and it's tough. And David's thirsty, and he's saying, oh, what I wouldn't give for a drink of water from that well that's way behind enemy lines. And here go the three. Let's go get him a drink. They fight their way through enemy lines, and they get to that well, and they get to that water. And because of the love for a man who took them out of bondage into breakthrough. Because of the the, the dedication to a leader who brought them into wholeness. Hmm? They were encouraged in the Lord. Nothing was too good. No sacrifice was too great. So out of this group become the 30 and the three... David's mighty men, and catch this, together these man cave friends, literal man cave friends, together they took Israel to the zenith of their history as a nation. Um, I, I believe with all my heart that there's a new season of grace and blessing coming to Word of Grace. I, I, just, I just sense since God's up to something new. And, and I encourage you today to say in your heart before God, God, I want to be one of the 30. I want to be one of the 30. I want to go from sidelines to center stage in this movement of God on the east side of Cleveland. I want to move from the crowd to the core of what God is doing here at Word of Grace. I I, I want something incredible 
to happen among us in this church. I, I, I want to see God move in new ways in Chesterland. I want to see God move in new ways on the east side of Cleveland. Huh? For that to happen, it starts with how we talk to ourselves. Because for a word of grace to fulfill the call of God on it as a church, it simply means that all of us are fulfilling the call of, our God, call of God on our lives as individuals who make up word of grace. Right? So, how's your self-talk? I think all of us, all of us have what I would call a, a, a mental board of directors, all right? You know what a board of directors is on a corporation or a business, whatever? A mental board of directors. And, and you know what? They sit in judgment. <laughs> Isn't that right? Every time we're ready to make a decision, do you have a mental board of directors? Every time you're ready to take a step forward, they're all like those annoying pop-ups on TV in the middle of a show that you like. Suddenly, they don't even wait for the advertisements between at commercial time. They're, you know what I'm talking about? A mental board of directors, family members, coaches, past leaders, maybe people at church that you've admired over the years. And every time you're ready to move forward, it seems like they've all got something to say. And some of them never have anything good to say in your brain as you're ready to take a step for God. They're part of your self-talk. I, I think some of us need to kick some people off of our mental board of directors this morning. You're done. Huh? You no longer have a voice in my head when it's time for me to move forward for God. Because I'm moving forward. Some of us need to kick some people off our mental board of directors. You know what? Um, and then there's the chairman of the board. Guess who that is? And we can't kick ourselves off. Isn't that right? So what do we do? Instead of trying to kick ourselves off the board, maybe it's just time to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Um, maybe it's time to pursue some friends like David had Jonathan that really do bear with us. You know, there's friends, the people we like to hang out with and we have a good time with, you have a lot in common with. And then there are those friends who really are friends to our calling and friends to our purposes in God. They know who we are. They know our strengths. They know our weaknesses. They know how we're wired. They know what we're called to. They're the ones that can bear with us, believe in us, support us, invest in us, cheer us on, kick us in the pants when we need it. Guys, we just don't need friends in this season of life. We need friends to our calling. Maybe we need to go out and find some of them. Maybe we need to review who our true friends really are. Hmm? Well, maybe it's time for you to run to the battle. Well, I, I really believe as I was thinking about this, even through my time in Vietnam and preparing uh, in these last hours and everything, I think God's putting some of us in touch with our hearts today. Man, I really do need some friends to my calling. I need people that bear with me, not just to, because I'm under construction. I need people to bear with me because God's doing something in my life. and He's got a plan for my life. I need people that really jump on board and help me to be all that God's called me to be. I think God's putting some of us in touch with our lives because our self-talk really stinks. And that's got to stop today. I think God's putting some of us in touch with our hearts today because some of us need to step up and get beyond Scripture, get beyond sermons, to say, I need to be a Jonathan to that guy. I need to be a Jonathan to that lady. They need someone to come alongside them, to bear with them as they're becoming and as they're discovering the purpose of God for their life. I want to be that. God, do you want me to be that person? 
I need to go the extra mile and become a Jonathan to somebody today. So um, when God puts us in touch with our hearts, how many know that's a good thing? That's his grace and his mercy, not his judgment. He puts us in touch with our hearts because he has hope for change for us. The way I am right now doesn't have to be the way I am tomorrow. The way I talk to myself today doesn't have to be the way I talk to myself tomorrow. The friends I have today don't need to be the friends I have tomorrow if they're not good for me. The friend I can be to somebody else tomorrow can be a powerful thing to help them become and discover calling as David had friends in his life in the decade of preparation. So, um, wrap this up. So, how are your friends to your calling? Who can you be a Jonathan to? And how's your self-talk?